You probably know about the events of April 14th, 1912. Uh, the, the unsinkable ship, uh, the Titanic, was heading from the UK to New York City. And on that night, the ship that was supposed to be unsinkable struck an iceberg and ultimately plunged into the icy waters and sank. There were more than 1,500 people who perished on that, that evening in the ship that was supposed to be unsinkable. Now, something you may not know about the, the Titanic, about that evening, um, there was a fairly new piece of technology being deployed there. It was the wireless telegraph. A man named Jack Phillips was the telegraph operator, which allowed the, the people aboard the boat to communicate with their loved ones and to celebrate what's going on in their, their voyage. On the night of April 14th, uh, Jack Phillips had a large stack of correspondence that he needed to work through, that he needed to send. But as he tried to send that correspondence, he kept getting interrupted. And not just once, not just twice, but over and over and over, he was getting interrupted by an incoming transmission. So at one point, uh, growing frustrated, he finally responded to the other radio operator. He was an operator on the ship, the Californian, who was also in the northern Atlantic. When he took time to listen, uh, he realized that the radio operator had been trying to communicate uh, that there were icebergs in the path of the Titanic that they needed to be aware of and correct their course that they might ultimately not collide into and, and possibly uh, suffer some sort of damage to their hull. Mr. Phillips received the communication. He had just six words to say in response. He said, shut up, shut up, I'm busy. And the rest is history, right? Like the passengers on the Titanic, many of us are blissfully sailing through our lives unaware that mortal danger may lie ahead. Like Jack Phillips, many of us are very busy. We're doing life, taking care of our business, pursuing our children, the things that we normally do as Americans. And yet oftentimes in the midst of our busyness, we ignore some of those subtle warnings that would suggest to us that maybe we're not quite on the right path. Maybe like the Titanic, the unsinkable ship, we've begun to believe the, the myth of our own invincibility. And even as people of God, people who would claim to be a seeker or a religious person or a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of his, uh, if we're not careful, we may be headed toward disaster and not even realize it. Today I want to speak to you about two things. I want to give you two warnings uh, that your life may be headed for trouble. And again, this is for you who are a devoted disciple of Jesus. This is for the person who's in the room that maybe you're just coming back to church for the first time in many years. It's for the person who uh, maybe you don't know Jesus Christ and you're just here because your life is, is hurting or broken or maybe you're just interested in what in the world we do uh, as churches on Sundays. I want to give you two warnings that your life may be headed for disaster. Two things here I want you to see. Um, you may be headed for disaster. You may have, be headed for trouble if, number one, you don't see and understand the depth of your own sin and sinfulness. Number two, you may be headed for disaster destruction if you don't understand or see the enormity of God's goodness. Today we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. And what we have are a contrast of two uh, different types of people. One is a Pharisee and the other is known to us only as a woman of the city, a sinner. Read with me again in chapter 7, verse 36. This is our introduction to the Pharisee. It says, one of the Pharisees asked him, and this is Jesus. Um, by the way, the Pharisees have just had a, a fairly lengthy discussion with Jesus about John the Baptist, and in the end, um, they did not follow Jesus. They had rejected him and the baptism of John the Baptist. And so this Pharisee breaks with the rest of the Pharisees. And rather than flat out rejecting him, he does something interesting, and it would have been costly to him. He invites Jesus to come and dine in his home. Again, verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked him Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. 
And so, again, this Pharisee has done something that would have been costly to him. He's broken ranks with the other Pharisees, which, by the way, if you don't know what a Pharisee is, uh, they were a very religious, uh, in in a sense, a renowned uh, group of Jews um, who were very strict adherents to the Old Testament law. So this man was very, very religious. As a matter of fact, if you would have lived uh, at this time in this place, you probably would have known who, by the way, his name is Simon. We're going to see that in a minute. You would have known who Simon is. You would have thought that Simon was a good moral teacher. You might have wanted to be like him. He was kind of an example of what a good person would have been like. Someone who was, you know, kind of doing okay by God. That would have been Simon the Pharisee. Now, again, interestingly enough, he's broken ranks with the other Pharisees, and he's invited Jesus to a very public banquet at his home. He's interested to hear likely who Jesus is and what he might have to say. Now, when you see that he was reclining at the table, you shouldn't think about what happens with my kids and we're at the table, you know, and they scoot their chair back a little bit and they recline, you know, and they're, they're eating and dropping food in their lap. That wasn't exactly what was happening here. I actually have a picture that might uh, make it a little more clear. Uh, in, the, in this day and age, when you recline at the table, um, you would lean toward the table on one elbow with your head facing the table and your feet facing away. And so you had to eat one-handed. You had to have some skills there. And, and I would assume a strong shoulder on one side. It doesn't look at, at all comfortable to me. If you ever invite me to your home and you want me to eat like this, please don't, right? I'd just rather sit in the chair and eat. But this is uh, the conventional way that they would have um, dined at a banquet like this. And so Jesus, he's here not just with Simon the Pharisee, but also some of his friends, perhaps some other Pharisees who were interested. Uh, we're not told what their names are, but Jesus is here with this man, the very religious man who would have been a moral example to his people. But then we get a different picture. And it's the picture of the woman. In verse, verses 37 and 38, it says, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus, he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, this woman would have been uh, likely understood to be the antithesis of the Pharisee. Um, she was not an example of the morality that you wanted your children to follow in. She would have been the opposite. When it tells us that she was a woman of the city, she was probably a prostitute and rather notorious throughout the city. In the same way the Pharisee would have been known for his morality, his righteousness, this woman would have been known for her sin. Her sin was so bad that many people um, would have had nothing to do with her. If they had seen her on the street, they might have passed by on the other side. They might have turned up their noses at her. But if you're here today and you're a sinner like this woman, we're just being very honest. Though the people knew that she was a sinner, I doubt anyone knew her sin better than she did. Because while they might have heard the stories about this event or that thing that she'd done, she knew them all. She probably knew pain and brokenness on a level that few of us will. The only reason she was allowed into this banquet on this day was due to a social custom that permitted the poor and the needy uh, to enter into such a banquet hoping to receive some of the leftovers after the invited guest had eaten. But then we see that she's not there for food. She's not there to eat. She's come up behind Jesus and she's weeping and not just a little. It's tears enough that she wets his feet. This woman knew the depth of her sin. She knew the debt that she owed before God. And she understood that she was incapable 
of repayment. So here she comes up behind Jesus, and she's weeping. And his feet are wet with her tears, and she kneels down. She takes down her hair. She begins to wipe his feet with her hair. She kneels a little further and begins to kiss his feet. And she takes out a flask. She begins to anoint Jesus' feet with this perfumed oil. The oil is the reason that she'd come. During this time, uh, women of their day, you would have known that a woman was beautiful or desirable uh, if she had such a flask. They would carry an alabaster flask around their, their neck, you know, like wear it like a necklace. And um, it would have been very expensive. This was likely the most expensive thing that this woman owned. And it would have been a symbol of beauty, perhaps a symbol even of status. Uh, it would have said that you were somebody of note or of worth. And the only way that she could have dumped this oil out to anoint Jesus' feet was to break the very thin neck of this flask and to empty it out on his feet. So this woman, who was aware of the depth of her sin, that she was a debtor before God, and that she was incapable of repayment, she comes to Jesus weeping, wiping his feet with her hair, kissing his feet, and then anointing them with her most precious possession. It was a statement, both of Jesus' worth and of the depth of her love for Jesus. Now, unsurprisingly, the Pharisee was shocked by this. Because good people, righteous people, religious people, um, you didn't intermix with sinners. Like You didn't spend time with people like this. You didn't want to be seen with people like this. You didn't want to be touched by people like this. The Pharisee is shocked, and it's not just due to social customs of his day. The Pharisee is shocked because he understood neither the depth of his sin nor the enormity of God's goodness. Again, I want to remind you, the first warning sign that you may be headed for disaster and destruction is that you don't see the depth of your own sin. The Pharisee had invited Jesus into his home to, to get a feel for who he was. He'd heard Jesus speak. He'd heard the message, the proclamation that Jesus had given. Now, it was, it was still veiled at this point, but Jesus had proclaimed to be the one whom the prophets of the Old Testament had foretold. John the Baptist had pointed who Jesus was, one who was greater than him. This Pharisee had heard, and it's likely that he invited Jesus into his home to feel him out. Like, is this really a prophet of God? Is this really, this man really who he says he is? Is he going to act and speak and, you know, all that like a prophet should, or is he not? So he invites him into his home to get a closer look at maybe who this Jesus character was. Now, at this point, he was interested in finding out about Jesus, but he wasn't interested in a Savior. He thought maybe Jesus was a man who could enrich his life or sharpen his understanding, uh, but he wasn't looking for a Lord. He wasn't looking for salvation in Jesus. And right off the bat, Jesus lets him down, in a sense. Look what it says here in verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus to his banquet, when he, when he saw this, he said to himself, he didn't speak this out loud, but in his mind, you know, he's being uh, couth a little bit. He's not speaking it, but he feels it. When he saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus, this is really interesting, it says Jesus answering, right? He knew what this man was thinking before he'd even spoke it. Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. He probably thought this was going to be some sort of teaching, a bit of wisdom going to be shared. And Jesus gives her a, a quick story. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owned, owed 500 denarii. Now, this would have been a denarius, a day's wages. So this was a, a good sum of money. One owed him 500 and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? 
Now, Jesus asked him a question um, that's designed to elicit a very specific response. And if you heard the story, most of us can answer this, and we don't have to be good Jews or Pharisees, right? Well, clearly it's the one who loved, or the one who was forgiven more is going to love more. You can see a hint of reluctance in the answer of Simon the Pharisee in verse 43. It says he answered the one, I suppose, who was forgiven more. The one for whom he canceled larger debt. Now, something just happened when Jesus asked that question. Because this Pharisee was a good moral man, right? He kept the law. He would have tithed his mint deal as cumin. He would have prayed publicly. People would have celebrated him as something of a religious hero, if you will. And this woman was derided by nearly everyone. No one would have been impressed with her. No one would have suggested that she was religious or right with God. No one would have been impressed with anything that she had to offer. And yet in telling this story, Jesus is beginning to point out that this man who considered himself to be righteous, who who seemed to think uh, that he could stand in judgment over a sinner, what Jesus is pointing out is he broke the first and greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This Pharisee, this teacher, wasn't keeping the first and the greatest. You know, the only way that we can look down on other people as sinners is if we built ourselves a pedestal of our own self-righteousness. He knew that this woman was a sinner, and he was right. She had sinned grievously against God. She probably hurt a lot of people along the way. She owed God an enormous debt that she couldn't pay. The Pharisee wasn't wrong about that. The place that the Pharisee got it wrong is that he failed to understand that he was the same. That he too owed a debt before God that there's no way that he could possibly pay. He asked Jesus into his home to have a discussion, not to express his devotion. He was looking for some sort of religious stimulation and not for a savior. He saw himself as good and wondered if Jesus could enrich his goodness. So Jesus told him this story that began to shed light on the condition of his heart. Two debtors, one owed 500, one owed 50. Both were forgiven by the moneylender. Which one loved more? The one who was forgiven more. So the first warning sign that we might be headed for destruction, that our lives may be off course and that uh, we're in desperate need of a correction uh, so that we don't um, miss the place that we ultimately want to arrive, miss the destination, if you will. The first warning sign is that we fail to see the depth of our own sinfulness. Maybe you're here today and you started looking down on other people You find yourself passing judgment at the way people talk or dress or act or whatever thing they might do. And you do so not grieving as God grieves over sin, but you find yourself elevating yourself in self-righteousness over other people. The first warning sign, you fail to see the depth of your own sin. The second is we don't see, or you don't see the enormity of God's goodness. To be honest with you, the second condition, failing to see God's goodness, is actually caused by the first. God's goodness, His grace, His mercy, and His love, they are brought into focus through the lens of our utter sinfulness. When we realize just how debt, how large a debt that we owe before God, when we realize how deep our sin is, how severe our rebellion against God, and we see the forgiveness that He's offered to us, then His grace, His forgiveness, His goodness comes in to focus. The woman, the sinner, the woman of the city, she'd seen what the Pharisee could not. And on this day, she comes into the house, not to eat, not to hear a sermon, but to offer worship to a worthy God. In verse 44, Jesus 
continues to scold the Pharisee a bit. It says, then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, which, by the way, um, was customary. If you were going to invite a guest into your home, um, you would give them water to wash th- their feet. Um, maybe even a kiss on the cheek and some uh, oil to anoint their head, but the bare minimum would have been water to wash their feet. And he points out that this Pharisee said, you invited me to the banquet and you gave me no water to wash my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which are many. If you're a pretty good sinner here in this room, if you feel like you may be beyond hope, like your sins are so many that Jesus uh, can't forgive them, I want you to know that Jesus is a greater Savior than you are a sinner. Jesus points out that this woman, whose sins are many, has been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he goes on to explain. Then those who were at the table with, with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. This is not the first encounter that this woman has had with Jesus. And we don't know where she came across this path. Maybe she'd heard the reports about the good news of a Savior who could forgive sins. We don't know exactly, you know, how their paths had crossed, if they'd had a prior conversation. We don't know any of that. But we know that on this day, this woman had come to Jesus in faith. That she'd come to him in gratitude because her sins had been forgiven. The reason that she was weeping was because she had been forgiven much. The reason that she was giving her most precious possession is because she already understood the worth of Jesus Christ. The reason she would kneel and wipe his feet with her hair and kiss his feet is because she understood that he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. She knew his worth. She was a woman who had been forgiven much. What we see in this biblical text is what matters here is not how great or how small of a sinner you are. But what really matters is what you do with your debt. The Pharisee thought himself a pretty good person. He was kind of interested in Jesus. Um, You know, what does he have to say? Who is this man? Is he really a prophet? He invited them into his home. He shared a meal with them. He was all there for a conversation. But because he didn't recognize the depth of his own sin, the enormity of his own debt, he also didn't see Jesus as a worthy Savior. He didn't get to experience the overwhelming goodness of God. For Those of you who are members of this church today, I want to to say this to you. Our love for God is a response to how deeply we see our sin and the forgiveness that God has extended to us. We, as sinners, people of the city, who have blown it in huge ways, who have sinned grievously against God, we ought to love God much because we have been forgiven much. The danger is that we get really busy with our lives. We're raising our kids and taking care of our spouse. Got to hit that date night on Friday night. You know, get the kids where they need to be. Make sure the bills are paid. We're working our way up in our jobs. And we're so busy living this physical life on this earth, which is but a vapor, right? It's here today and gone tomorrow, that we fail to experience. We fail to come to know Jesus Christ, to recognize the depth of our own sin and the enormity of God's goodness that we would spend our lives pursuing empty ends rather than giving Jesus his due. Jesus is worthy of our greatest treasure. Verse 
of our deepest devotion, of our everything, wouldn't it be a tragedy if we spent our lives instead giving ourselves to other things, inferior and empty things of this world? And here's the trouble. When we don't see the enormity of our sin, when we don't see the depth of our own sinfulness, we begin to walk in pride. A fall is near. We plunge headlong into things that can destroy us. We don't walk in the wisdom and the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Destruction is near. When we don't see God's goodness, we misplace our worship, we fall into idolatry, and it's empty. But I have good news for you. Jesus Christ is here today. The Holy Spirit of God is in our midst. And God in his goodness is calling sinners like you and like me to bow before him and to worship. Would you watch this video with me? Hi, my name is Kinsey. I have new life in Christ and I am recovering from anxiety, depression, people pleasing, insecurities, lack of trust, and much more. Growing up, I didn't have a relationship with God and I didn't attend church. I viewed him as the creator of the world and as the judge and ruler of my life. I believe that if I did well in and with my life, that the Lord and others would love and affirm me. I grew up on performance-driven and conditionally-based love which led to people pleasing and a desire for affirmation. At times, our home was negative, toxic, filled with anger and rage, and emotionally, mentally, and physically destructive. I withdrew into a safety bubble and allowed the actions and the words and thoughts of others to determine who I was and to define my worth. This left me with anger, resentment, insecurity, and a pattern of self-destruct. In 2016, I harmed someone. I was arrested and prosecuted and was facing 15 years in prison. Through this season of my life, I experienced a lot of shame and guilt and became severely depressed and suicidal. The Lord didn't leave me where I was and asked me to get my act cleaned up. He met me at my lowest and worst moment of life, and he stood with me in the fire. In 2019, the Lord led me to regeneration. He helped me uncover and identify sin, label hurts, and bring secrets out of the darkness. Through this discipleship study, he helped me learn more about himself, his character, and how to live life when faced with sin, conflict, and hurts. Regen is for every single person. We all have sin. We all have habits that are unhealthy and struggles that are hurtful. God desires for us to be freed from those chains and to live life devoted to Him and the gospel. If you give your life to the Lord, I promise you won't regret it. Your life will be transformed forever. You'll see Kinsey a lot of Sunday mornings. She's out front, and she welcomes people to our church. Kinsey is someone who loves much, and it's evident in her life, and we're thankful for her story. Maybe you're here today, and as you think about your life, and you try to consider the warning that's been given. Maybe you find that you're like the Pharisee. Maybe you're pretty religious. You were raised in church. You know the Bible. You've walked an aisle, prayed a prayer. Maybe you've been baptized. But maybe you find yourself looking down on others, dismissing them in their wickedness. Maybe your worship has grown stale. It feels obligatory. You come to church and you open the word because that's what you're supposed to do. But you find your heart unmoved by the goodness of God. This morning is an opportunity to stop and to heed the warning 
to repent of your pride and self-righteousness, maybe of your apathy toward God, to ask God to make you weep again over your sin, to help you to see His worth, for you to bow before Him in worship. Maybe you're here today and you identify more with the woman. Maybe you're a notorious sinner. Maybe it was difficult for you to walk through the doors today because everybody knows where you've been and what you've done. Maybe you've been labeled an addict or a thief, an adulterer, a liar, a bad kid, or a deadbeat father. Maybe you're a sinner and no one knows, but you know. What matters is not how great or how small your sin, it's what you choose to do with your debt. Jesus Christ came in flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. He walked on this earth, and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And then he went to the cross to offer his body, to offer himself as an atoning sacrifice for your sin. That rather than trusting in your own goodness and your own ability to somehow satisfy your debt before God, which you cannot do, Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay the debt that you owed, to endure the punishment that you deserved. If you're here today and you find yourself, you're a sinner, and you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ, you've never had a recognition of his lordship, you've never surrendered yourself to him, I want you to know that there's room for you at the foot of the cross. Jesus died that you might find new life in him, that you might never be the same. The sinful woman in this passage today was saved by faith in Jesus Christ. It wasn't because she earned it. It wasn't because she deserved it. It's because Jesus Christ freely gave it. She didn't trust in her own ability to repay the debt. She knew that was impossible. Instead, she trusted in Jesus to pay that debt for her. Would you bow with me? Lord, we're thankful for the stories that we hear of people that are represented by both characters in this story. Or the story of me, uh, raised in church. I knew the scriptures. A godly home, godly mentors. And yet, Lord, I trusted in my own righteousness. And it wasn't until I found myself flat on my face at my sin that I could fully see the extent of your love for me. For those here who are utterly sinful, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. May you draw us unto yourself. Father, you're the one who saves. So we pray that this might be a, ta a time where we respond in obedience to you. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.